Okay, before we get into breaking down this trailer, we're going to have to do a quick rundown of all the important news relating to this game that came out of E3, and also some news that has come out since then, since this video is really, really late. If you're the type who reads all of the news anyway and wants to skip to the analysis, there should be an annotation on screen allowing you to do just that. For the rest of you, stick around because this will provide some necessary context for the analysis itself. First off, I'll just read a quote from Tetsuya Nomura, the game's director, to get a few things out of the way. For the most part, we've established the foundation, the basic battle system and mechanics of what's going into the game, the development of that is close to complete. Since this title is in HD, building resources and mass production of areas and other elements, including mini-games and other smaller items, takes time. Some of them are polished to a close-to-final state. At the same time, some elements are still in the planning phases and we haven't laid out the groundwork yet. But the basic structure of what's going into the game is set. It's now a matter of mass production of different elements within the game. So there you have it. Despite the fact that the core of the game is sort of there, the game is still pretty darn early in development, at least in terms of actual assets being completed. There are still a lot of factors that haven't even been decided upon. For example, Nomura has said that the team is considering bringing back drive forms from KH2 for this game. That is a huge gameplay thing, guys. You can't be considering something like that if your game is far along. After Birth by Sleep and 358 Over Two Days incorporated elements of online play, Nomura has said he's interested in implementing some kind of online mode into this game, but that it's a low priority. It'll only happen if there's extra time to build it in on top of everything else. On that note, he also said they don't just want to add such a mode in as a slapped-on last-minute addition. When asked about the presence of Star Wars Worlds, Nomura said including such settings would be difficult because of licensing issues. For the record, stuff like Marvel and Indiana Jones probably falls under the same umbrella. I'm not going to read his whole statement, you can do that if you like, there's a link in the description, but basically the Square team works with Disney's animation houses primarily, and there's a lot of issues with going between studios to get material to work with. It could be a bit of a troll because he doesn't want to reveal Star Wars related content yet, but the way that the statement is worded makes it sound like an ongoing situation, and since the game is already in development, I would say it's unlikely that we'll be seeing anything from Star Wars in Kingdom Hearts 3, and probably not anything related to Marvel or Lucasfilm at all. Nomura also stated that Kingdom Hearts 3 won't have any quick time events. Initially, he didn't provide more details than that, so it was difficult to tell if he was talking about Reaction Commands, a gameplay mainstay from Kingdom Hearts 2, or smaller quick time events, like the ones that are used to trigger certain attacks in games like Birth by Sleep. But in a more recent interview, Nomura said that Reaction Commands have been removed entirely, and that the game has been made more challenging by refocusing things on precise timing. Keep that in mind for just a second, because I'm going to be returning to that statement at greater length as we move forward into the actual trailer. Everyone is making a big to-do about this game's parkour features. Well, sorry guys, but it isn't quite as free and liberating as you might think. Observe that as Sora runs up this wall, you can actually see a few golden sparkles in the air nearby. We see the exact same sparkles appearing on the wall that he runs up to reach Rock Titan, on the wall on the back of this battle arena, and for about two frames and Sora is jumping between these rocks. Presumably, the poles in this part function similarly. These sparkles are likely designating areas that Sora can free run on. This design makes a lot of sense to me, though. It probably isn't as limiting as it might sound by breaking it down like that. As we observe later in the trailer, Sora can navigate back and forth on these surfaces, so it's not as if it's some kind of scripted sequence that we activate. These sparkles just serve as an in-game indication of what is traversable space and what isn't. After all, they can't let you run on every surface in the game. So instead of wasting the player's time by having them run at stuff and be confused about what they can and can't free run, it will be made clear in a very recognizable but relatively subtle way. Also, in another interview, it was said that you'll still be able to perform attacks and techniques in some free running areas, like the one that we see here. Further details were not provided, but again, it suggests that these areas are still going to provide you with a lot of gameplay options, even though they aren't quite as freeform as you would see in a game like Mirror's Edge. So, before we move any further, I'm just gonna go ahead and say that this location is Olympus Coliseum. Like, there's no need to analyze anything, it's confirmed. It's Olympus Coliseum. End of story. But of course, we're in a much more open area than we've seen in previous versions of Olympus Coliseum. The team is aiming to have all worlds be seamless and free of loading screens. Ideally, you'll only see loading screens when you're switching between worlds. While the game itself isn't exactly open world in structure, it is much more open and expansive than previous entries in the series. Okay guys, just a quick friendly reminder before we get into the gameplay any further, the user interface is fake. 
Before you come back and say, no, see, the health bars go down. Fine, some parts of it may be active, but this UI is still pretty fake. At the very least, Sora has infinite MP, and the command menu at the left side is completely static. We don't see any shortcuts or any menu navigation when Sora uses spells. This isn't even me theorizing, guys. Namura has said, the UI shown in this trailer is a temporary one, and once you actually get to use Attraction Flow, it will also change the UI while active. Remember the D23 trailer? How the blaster things had their own custom command menu? That's what he's talking about. This is fake. So let's really get into the gameplay now. The spellcasting in this game is really interesting and different from what we've seen in Kingdom Hearts before. Sora casts spells in this trailer and does it while still moving around, something that none of the Kingdom Hearts protagonists have ever been able to do. Not only can spells be fired on the go, but it seems like you can change their behavior dynamically. Fire can be used as the typical homing shot, or it can be used as a finisher in your melee combo, just like there were finisher variations of spells in Kingdom Hearts 2. But that kind of dynamic modification we observed, as I said, in Kingdom Hearts 2. I think this gets a little bit deeper. Take, for instance, the Arrow spell. Arrow is now an area of effect attack, like the version of the spell seen in Birth by Sleep. Blizzard, in turn, generates a rail of ice on the ground to allow for flow motion trickery. Looking at this, it seems like the spells have a lot more individuality and specialized uses. This is a bit of a turn from the previous mainline games, building off the magic systems in the handheld titles. In Birth by Sleep and Dream Drop Distance, spells were abilities, and there were lots of them. A lot more than the three basic variations of each type of elemental attack that you see in 1 and 2. They were individual moves with their own effects and visuals. You could get yourself a Fyraga burst or a Blizzard raid, all kinds of crazy stuff. Since the handheld games were all kind of experimenting with the different styles of gameplay, just going back to the Kingdom Hearts 2 magic system would seem derivative. Instead, we see that each spell has a very specific use. Fire seems like it might have a lasting burning effect, dealing additional damage over time. There's lingering fire effects on the ground at certain parts, which doesn't by any means confirm that theory, but it does generally suggest that fire has some lasting effects. Then we get to Arrow, which can be cast right around Sora or on enemies at a distance. Not that big of a difference from stuff like Thunder in Kingdom Hearts 2, but it's still worth pointing out, I think. Then, with Blizzard, we see something that honestly isn't all that effective as a piece of offensive magic. It creates a rail for Sora to launch off of, letting you initiate a flow motion attack. Also, it has the added benefit of temporarily freezing enemies that are caught in its path, like this soldier here. Even though each category of spell seems pretty unique, it looks like you might be able to modify individual spells even more. Call me crazy, but I feel like the fire effect seen at the end of this combo is pretty different from the effect seen when fire is used normally. So maybe you'll be able to activate different variations of spells through abilities or depending on what circumstances you use certain spells in. That's speculation, obviously, and I don't have a ton of visual evidence to support it. We only see two types of fire used, the normal one and the fire used as a finisher move. Again, this is something we observed in Kingdom Hearts 2, so it might not be anything all that new or groundbreaking. But with that said, I am still thinking that each spell will have different versions that can be activated dynamically in battle. Why do I think this, you may ask? Well, it's more to do with what we don't see. Blizzard here creates a rail along the ground when Sora uses that spell on the ground. But what does it do in the air? After all, there's got to be an aerial version of Blizzard, and I don't think it'd behave this way. Maybe we can generate rails in the air, just like with the ground version, or maybe it can function completely differently. The point is that magic actually seems really diverse, and each spell has its own specific uses. Like I said, it'd be a bit weird to go back to the simple magic system after BBS and DDD. And since Namura said that they were taking out reaction commands, the game is going to need some way to keep Sora's moveset diverse and powerful, like in KH2. Letting you change the attributes of your spells by performing them at different times would be a good way to handle this shift away from QTEs without sacrificing a diverse and powerful arsenal. Again, Namura said there's going to be more focus on timing in this game as opposed to Kingdom Hearts 2. I think this fire spell might be a good example. Even though I've already mentioned it since I was talking about Blizzard, let's talk about Flow Motion. Flow Motion is back, but it doesn't look as strong as it was in the last game. You can still kick off of walls, but you won't be launching into Flow Motion constantly. It doesn't seem that way, at least. After all, we see Sora roll and air dodge and all sorts of other things that would have sent you straight into Flow Motion in DDD. There's also this shot where Sora is sliding down a hill which would feel... I don't know, pointless? In a game with movement abilities that are just as powerful as the ones found in Dream Drop Distance. The fact that there's possibly a dedicated spell for getting you into flow motion at any given position would seem to indicate to me that the ability has been drastically depowered. Thank goodness. So in this shot, Sora blocks an area of effect attack with his standard block. 
Correct me if I'm wrong, but have you been able to do this before? I know that the block could protect you from some ridiculous stuff, but I don't recall it ever working against attacks like this that sent out a shockwave but don't actually have a physical presence. Sora clearly reacts to it though, spinning to brace his keyblade from the impact like he does in Kingdom Hearts 2. Seriously, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this might be new. Okay guys, I'm sticking to my guns on this train thing, it's fake and scripted and fake. To people who got onto me when I talked about this last time, the reason I was so steadfast in saying that this train was fake is because they told us at the time that the attractions were like summons, which could be dynamically summoned at any location. The boat thing makes sense, it can show up anywhere and just clip through the ground. The teacups make sense, they just need a relatively flat area. The train doesn't make any sense as a summonable thing. There's no way that the AI could figure out a way to dynamically map this train to be useful in any combat situation in any area. Imagine summoning the train here. It's too long to even move in this space. How's it gonna hit anything? The reason I objected so strongly before was because, again, we've been told this was an ability akin to a summon. It wouldn't work dynamically, no matter how good the AI was at trying to map a route, because it simply wouldn't work in some game spaces and in some combat situations. But they're showing it here again on the same boss. This leads me to believe that it is, in fact, scripted, and it might only get used for certain boss fights or in certain areas. This is actually probably supported by what Nomura said about attraction flow at E3. He said that you'll be able to activate the attraction flow stuff after meeting certain requirements. It's unclear if this is referring to individual conflicts or the overall game, but either way it would seem to suggest that you'll only be able to use certain attractions at certain times. In fact, if they work similarly to the Keyblade Transformation abilities, which we actually did get more details on, I think you'd have to fulfill specific requirements in individual battles before you can use them. But I'm getting ahead of myself. You see, Nomura says that you'll be able to initiate Keyblade Transformations by fulfilling certain requirements during combat, seemingly referring to individual enemy engagements. So it's probably not dependent upon this EX gauge we see here. Who knows how it'll work. But yeah, we'd seen this specific Keyblade Transformation last time around at D23 in 2013. The bazooka we see here is actually part of the same transformation as the dual pistols. It's just a later phase of that transformation. The two pistols form and become one to create this, the Ragnazooka. Or at least that's what I call it. But these two forms, the spiky pistols and the Ragnazooka, actually aren't the only two forms we see in this trailer. We'll get to that in a little bit. We see a few other instances of Keyblade transformation in this trailer. This sequence here is actually a transformation, not a summon or an attraction. This Keyblade here is probably the Olympus Keyblade for the game. You can actually see Zeus on the Keyblade. He's very obviously featured during the transformation, but he is visible when the Keyblade is in its normal state too, just to a lesser extent. This transformation is generally a bit janky. It goes through so many form shifts on the way to becoming the Chariot that it's just absurd. Since we've seen that these transformations can have multiple forms, maybe we're seeing a cut-together transformation sequence, skipping over what could, eventually, be different phases of this transformation. Of course, the trailer only clearly shows us the chariot. Perhaps that was the only thing that was finished in time for the trailer? Now, this transformation sequence is a bit tricky. We don't really see Sora transforming his Keyblade here. We can't see anything here, and then in the next frame, which is after a cut, he has guns. You can tell just from the enemy placement that these are two different takes, so it's a bit confusing as to if you have to activate these guns before getting along the ice rail, or if the ice rail itself activates them. This is made even weirder by the fact that after this cut, you can see the reticle for the third person mode fading away. How would that have been in third person mode while simultaneously grinding along the rail? But either way, we don't actually see the ice rail here, so it's a bit difficult to make a call as to if he's actually jumped off the rail in this take. In the next shot, the rail is clearly present, so we at least know that you can descend like this after jumping off of the rail, guns blazing. Also, remember how I said that there was more to this particular transformation? Well, these aren't the guns that we saw earlier in this trailer. These look more like crossbows, which was the primary mode of use that we saw back in the D23 trailer. See here? They transform into the spiky pistols we saw earlier in this trailer, and then back to crossbows. So, assuming that these are still part of the same transformation, we've seen at least three forms for this single transformation. This really reinforces what I was saying earlier, that the chariot transformation is not the only mode for that Keyblade. Alright, so backing up a bit, we're here at Rapunzel's world. The development team apparently proposed Tangled as a setting with the suggestion that Rapunzel could use her hair in combat. To be clear, no one has said it's actually going to be like that, they only said it was proposed like that. 
Please be excited for more information, I guess. We're winding down now, so a few other stray things to get out of the way before we get to the one big thing. Just to make things clear, the Attraction Flow abilities aren't replacing the traditional Kingdom Hearts style of summons. There will still be summons in the game of Disney characters like you would expect. We just haven't seen any of them yet. Also, a quick word on Sora's new outfit. Nomura said that he wanted something sporty and sleek, partly because Sora will be doing so many acrobatics in this game. The environment reacts to your magic spells. Obviously, I've already pointed out the fire and ice effects, but arrow also affects your environment. If you're in an area with grass on the ground, the grass will be whipped around by the spell and leave a lasting impression on the ground. Maybe cure spells will make plants sprout from the ground and then suddenly die, Princess Mononoke style? Anybody? No? Just... Just, just me? Okay. Now, some of you may be saying to yourself, Jacob, haven't you completely skipped over the one major element of this trailer? All of the stuff at the very beginning and end, with the two guys playing chess together? Well, I'm putting it at the end, since discussing this necessitates going into MAJOR SPOILER TERRITORY. So, if you're trying to remain spoiler-free for the existing Kingdom Hearts games, particularly Birth by Sleep and Dream Drop Distance, I would advise you to stop watching now. Don't worry, you've gotten all the important non-story information, so you won't be missing much. But yeah, spoilers are now live, so watch yourself. You've likely already heard, or deduced for yourself, that the chess game is probably representative of the final battle of Kingdom Hearts 3. Xehanort's pieces are representative of his 13 Warriors of Darkness, and Ericus's pieces are representative of the 7 Warriors of Light. Before we get into actually looking at these individual pieces, I just want to say that people should calm down a bit with some of the crazier analysis. For instance, some people are saying that Xehanort takes one of Ericus's pieces, indicating that he's going to take someone early in Kingdom Hearts 3, or perhaps that he already has. Meanwhile, Ericus has captured one of Xehanort's pieces, but Xehanort has another piece that looks identical, so people are saying there might be two versions of the character that this particular piece represents. Guys, we need to calm down a bit here. This is called they recycled an asset when they made the trailer. Or at least, that's most likely what it is. I wouldn't hedge any bets on the moment-to-moment -moment beats of this game of chess, every single move and every single piece, being important or representative of something in Kingdom Hearts 3. For the sake of brevity, we're going to run through the obvious pieces really quickly. We have a crown here, which represents Sora, Mickey Mouse ears, which obviously represent Mickey, and then a Heartless logo on the good guy's side, which represents Riku. On the villain's side, we've got an hourglass for young Xehanort, two gears for Vinitas, spikes and a moon for Issa, and a goat-looking thing for Master Xehanort. Of course, it could be that none of those are right, but those seem like the obvious choices. Then we get into the trickier ones. We'll start with the villains. We have two things that look like the Guardian that always hangs out with Xehanort's Heartless. It could be that these are representative of both Xehanort's Heartless and the Guardian, or it could just be that they recycled a chess piece, and it's removed from the board at some point during this sequence, and isn't technically part of the 13. However, if the Guardian is going to count as his own piece, that could confirm an interesting fan theory. I've seen a lot of people suggest that the Guardian is actually a representation of Terra, bound to Xehanort's Heartless. I'm not going to get into the nitty-gritty of that theory right now, partly because there are a lot of holes in said theory that I don't want to discuss, but it's interesting if nothing else. Then we've got two cubes here. Everyone seems to have latched onto these representing Luxord. Of course, that's just speculation, and they could always represent something new that we don't know of. After all, I'd like to hope that there would at least be one or two new villains in Kingdom Hearts 3. We've also got this right here, which some people are speculating is the keychain that one of the foretellers in Kingdom Hearts Unchained Keys has. If you have no idea what I just said, then don't worry about it too much. On the good guy's side, we have this star here. The most obvious choice here would be Kairi, since it at least vaguely resembles a Palpu fruit, and even more closely resembles the keychain of her only known keyblade, Destiny's Embrace. If I wanted to get really nerdy, I'd say that this actually more closely resembles Namine's fake lucky charm from Chain of Memories, just because the shape is a bit closer, but that's one heck of a long shot. Some of these other ones are kind of odd. Note, first of all, that there are eight pieces here, but there are only supposed to be seven heroes. Well, two of these pieces seem nearly identical, and one of them is actually taken off the board later in the trailer, so we can probably assume that one of them is just a placeholder and doesn't represent anything. Well, that, or maybe the people talking about Xehanort taking a piece later in the trailer are actually onto something. There are a few different theories as to what these pieces could represent, but for now, let's just say that they are Wayfinders, as in the charms that Aqua made for herself, Terra and Ventus. Then, let's say that these are either Terra and Ven, or Terra and Aqua, and the fact that Xehanort took one is representative of how Terra is now on his side. Unlikely, but I felt like it was worth throwing out there. 
Perhaps more realistically, we could look at what each of their keychains are. After all, other than Sora and Master Xehanort, for pretty much all of the characters we've identified so far, the symbol on their chest piece matches their keychain. Unfortunately, none of the heroes of Birth by Sleep have keychains that perfectly match up with any of these. If you push it, you can kind of see how Aquas or Vens could match up with either of these, but I'm not really convinced based on that. All the same, I'm still pretty confident that Aqua will be one of the heroes, so it wouldn't surprise me if one of these represents her somehow. Who knows, maybe this is a Wayfinder and it represents Aqua. After all, she was much more fixated on those things than Terra and Ven ever were. Lastly, we have this one in the back. Yet again, you could make an argument for this one resembling Aqua's keychain, perhaps even a bit better than the others we looked at. But personally, I'm partial to saying this is Lee. It's a stretch, but you could say that this piece looks like the logo on Lee's frisbees from Birth by Sleep, and it sort of resembles the flame design on his Keyblade. I know that's a long shot, but let's face it guys, this is all a long shot. Other than the ones that I went over in the beginning, this is all guesswork. Really, it's hardly analysis anymore, it's speculation. For all we know, these could be completely new heroes and villains that will be introduced in Kingdom Hearts 3. Jeez, that took me a lot longer to make than it should have. Well, anyway, that's everything useful out of E3 2015 regarding Kingdom Hearts 3. Don't worry, we're gonna hear a lot more about this game in the near future, both at D23 in Anaheim in August, and at D23 in Tokyo in December. I wouldn't necessarily expect any new footage until the event in December, but we'll at least get some more information at Anaheim. Until then, if you want to watch me analyze another Square Enix-related trailer, you can click that link in the corner there to watch me go through the Final Fantasy VII Remake teaser. Also, at some point, I'm going to make another video about something or other from E3. When I make it, I guess the other link will take you to it. If I don't ever get around to making something else for E3, then, well, I guess it'll take you to something else Kingdom Hearts-related. Are you okay with that? Okay.